Well, here we are, episode 13 of the Film Man and the Film Fan podcast. G'day, Dan. And as per the title of the podcast, we're both film fans. So what's a movie that you've really enjoyed that you've seen lately? Of course, Brent, movies are something that we must treat as our bread and butter. Yep. The movie that I have seen recently is Uproar. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we had a fantastic Q&A screening here on Tuesday, the 3rd of October. Mm-hmm. We screened it with the director Paul Middleditch and Sonia Whiteman who's the screenwriter. A little bit of history to that um, relationship. Sonia and I have been friends since we were about 14 or 15 and she actually lives in Sydney with Paul who's her husband Um, and they've been living in Australia for a long time and I haven't seen her for ages and it was so lovely to catch up with someone whom I got on with really well Mm. as a kid and into my 20s and hadn't seen for a while. And it's, you know, when you see people who you've known for a long time, you just snap back into it. It's really easy. It was (laughs) very cool to do a QA and a screening here at the cinema with someone who's an old friend. Mm. And, and, you know, the stage from being teenagers sort of knocking about, you know, hanging out. And then actually, you know, here we are as adults and, you know, talking about a movie that your friend has screenwritten in the cinema (laughs) that, I own, you know, yeah. it was just a really nice experience. Um, we had a really great crowd here for the April Q and A. We introduced the film, and then um, I sat in on the screening because I hadn't yet seen it. And um, those two, of course, have seen it a million times. So they <laughs> they popped off to the wonderful Vintry and had a, a, a bite to eat and a, a glass of local beverage. Um, uh, the film itself is beautiful, in one word. Um, Julian Dennison is. One of the leads, we know him from Hunt for the Water People. Uh, there's James Rolleston who made his name in the film Boy. There's uh, Reese Darby, yeah. of course. Say no more. Reese is on. <laughs> is Reese in every TV show and movie at the I moment? I think so. He is. He's a busy guy. He's a busy guy. And a local. <laughs> um, interestingly, and I always thought this was an interesting choice. Many drivers in the film. Yeah. And I haven't seen her in a film for a while, so. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about her as I sort of work through the cast because I do think it's worthwhile touching on two or three of the, the key cast members from this film. Julian Dennison is known as the sort of the comedic young Kiwi actor. He was in the Deadpool yes. fil- films as well. He is incredible in this film. He is. It's, it's not just a step up, it's several steps up. He is clearly a very, very good actor. And what I love about it is that it's almost like you're seeing Julian Dennison discover his roots, let alone his character's roots, right. on screen. Because it's very, new, very much a New Zealand story, set in 1981 around the Springbok rugby tour, where there was a three-month rugby tour and a whole lot of protest around um, what was going on back in South Africa and why is that rugby team coming to New Zealand when there's apartheid going on in South Africa, which is essentially sponsored racism uh, from the government. And it's set in 81, but it absolutely feels really fresh. It feels like a 2023 movie, which on the one hand is great because it lifts up all these themes for people to witness on screen now, but it also is slightly depressing that (laughs) this stuff is still going on, you know? Exactly. (laughs) But it also translates beautifully into something that's going on overseas, but very much a New Zealand story. And... Honestly, Julian Dennison is so good in this movie. It's unbelievable the step up he's made. Not that I didn't think he was a good actor because he definitely has the comedic chops, but in this film he feels like he's really grown into becoming a great adult actor. And I think it shows that there is a big future for him in more dramatic roles. Reese Darby, we often, you know, we, we know Reese personally and yeah. you talk to him and he sounds like often his characters. <laughs> yeah. Like, wow, you're just talking just like, you know, this character. But in this movie, he has a really great, um, rather than outright comedy, he's got a beautiful nuance to his performance. And it's something that you don't always see from him. And I think he does an incredible job himself. James Rolleston, it feels like quite a um, bare bones role. You almost feel like he's talking about what he's been through personally when he had the world at his feet after Boy and then mm. he had uh, the terrible car accident. Yes, yeah. um, You can see the mark in his throat. They make it obvious from where he had a pipe in his neck from the accident he had, the scars on his leg. And it all gets tied into the character he's playing, which is Julian Dennison's older brother who's recovering from an injury, who used to be the first 15 captain. Right. Um, and then Minnie Driver is a 
total revelation. I sort of, I, I guess I'd never really thought too much of Minnie Driver's acting, but that's probably because I haven't really seen many films that no, she's been in. So, been a while. And it's been a while. And she plays uh, the mum of Julian Dennison and James Rolleston's characters, and she is amazing. And that's the thing. they, All of the key actors and actresses blow it out of the park. And then the film itself, I found it in the first act, it was a little bit sort of on the nose and slightly light, and then it just built and built and built like a great album. Not a single, you know, like mm. not a pop single. <laughs> yeah. It felt like you were really going on a journey through the film. And at, at, at some point in, you know, some points in the movies, I was definitely getting a bit wet in the eyes. <laughs> um, I think there was some water coming off yeah, my brow. Yeah, must have been, yeah. Um, that would have been maybe one I think of your I, snacks. I, it would have been, yeah. I think when I was drinking my water, it yeah, sort of splashed right, up into spilled. my eyes. Yeah, yeah, I just of course. wipe it out. <laughs> Funnily enough, it was in both eyes. <laughs> it's a really emotional film. It's mm. beautifully done. The script that Sonia wrote is, they've clearly put a huge amount of time into it. They said it took about seven years from start to finish. Wow. They've worked really hard on it. The cinematography is stunning, great on the big screen. It's definitely a big screen movie. However, I can see it becoming a huge part of that New Zealand film canon yeah. that people keep revisiting. Uh, great film. Yeah, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And the audience as well. Mainly an older audience. You know, I would say most people were in their 50s at least, if not their 60s. And um, the first comment I made before the Q&A started at the, the end of the film was wow what a wonderful film and you sort of the hum from the audience was oh yeah yeah i mean that was you know and there, were, there were a few tears i think a few people ducked out as soon as the screening finished <laughs> yeah um highly recommend it please come and see it it's a film that i think you should see yeah. let alone go and see for entertainment purposes you must see this film well i think it'd be good because for me 1981 i was still at high school and i remember all this going on in auckland and everything at Eden Park, and, and that's, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it, so that's going to be good. Interestingly, it's set in Dunedin, and Paul, as director, he was asked from the audience, um, you know, how did you get hold of that old police car and those old uniforms, and, you know, where did you find the little pockets of Dunedin? And he's like, well, actually, we took some old shots of from on the hills looking down at, at the beach in the city, and the only difference was now there's an IKEA building. <laughs> it looks almost the same as it did in 1981. Amazing. And um, some of the blocks they use where there's some sort of protest scenes, they didn't need to do anything. They just mm. needed to, you know, make sure there was no one in the background, <laughs> and the buildings look the same. You yeah. know, it's a and and places a very old city, and and um, you know, it's got a definite look and feel to it, um, and it still has very much the same look as 1981. So out of 10 Jaffers? Nine Jaffers. Wow. Nine Jaffers. Yeah, a must-see. Big, big recommendation. <laughs> New Zealand film. Yeah. Have you been to see anything lately, Brent? I have. And one I was really excited to see was The Creator. Mm. And I came out of it, and this is, it's really bizarre. I really enjoyed it, right? Visually, it's absolutely stunning. And it's really quite relevant as well, because it's about AI, which is of course, is all the big talk at the moment. Gareth Edwards did Rogue One, one of my favourite Star Wars movies. Me too. He makes everything look so good. Yep. It just looked good. There were times when I was sitting there going, it's a little bit Blade Runner in the way it looks. It's a little bit Star Wars and a little bit The Golden Child. If you remember that Eddie mm, Murphy movie about the Golden Child, yeah. because it is centred around a child yeah. and AI. But I just, you know how when you come out of a movie sometimes you go, I just, I really love that. That was so good. I really had to think about it because mm. there's a lot of things in there that you do have to think about. Mm. Um, but I think people should go and see it. It's got a good story. Um, you know, and uh, I don't want to give too much away, but you know, the AI is not as bad as everybody thinks the AI is in this movie. There's a lot of shots of America coming to save everybody as normal, but it is a beautiful, beautiful movie to look at. And it's really enjoyable. It doesn't feel long. I think the acting is terrific. So, you know, I'd say I'd still give it eight out of ten Jaffers. Mm, okay. But it did but I think it's good to come out of a movie sometimes and really have to think about it. I right? agree. I think using a metaphor, a music metaphor, because we love talking music <laughs> yep. in movies, sometimes I think I hear a song or I hear a new album that I've been really excited about and I do worry when I when I finish my first listen and go, I love it. Yeah. I think sometimes the best music and film are ones that you leave the experience and you're not sure. Yeah. 
Um, and, you know, some of the best movies I've seen in the last few months and over the years are movies that I have left the cinema and then over the next few days I'm still thinking about them. And that's when I go, well, hang on, I'm still thinking about that movie. It has made an impression on me. Yeah. And there's definitely some weight to a film leaving an impression on you mm. rather than leaving the cinema going, yeah, I like that. And then, you know, you don't really think about it again. <laughs> yeah. I'm not saying there's anything, anything wrong with that. Like no. if there's a, a pop film where mm. you go, you sit there for two hours, you yeah. enjoy it, you eat your popcorn, you're having fun in the theater, and then it sort of disappears off into the film diary. Yeah. Um, I, I do personally find that sometimes when you've got a film that's giving you the feels for the next few days and it's sort of growing in stature, I find that often more rewarding. Yeah. I think I'll go back and see it a second time. Okay. Well, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that in itself is a, mm. is a pretty good sign. Yeah. But if you want to see a good bit of science fiction and a good bit of action and a good thing to, I've got to think about this, mm. then you have to see the creator. Yeah, sounds good. So, Dan, one of the reasons I got into radio, because as a kid, I just loved music. And I thought, what a great job. Work in radio and play your favorite songs. And I'm just so pleased that the Talking Heads movie is coming out. Because the other day, because I love music, but I also love the Muppets, I shared on my social media Kermit the Frog singing (laughs) Once in a Lifetime from Talking Heads, where he absolutely recreates the video, and it's just perfect. Amazing. I love... (laughs) That halfway through that sentence, I was thinking to myself, where is this going? <laughs> it's just great. Where is this I'm going? I'm a big Talking Heads fan. So when I saw those two combined, I went, brilliant. Yeah, over the school holidays, actually, um, I was talking with my wife, Anna, and a good friend of ours. And it was just a sort of, I was having a quiet beer and we were just relaxing in the evening. And I was thinking, what, com-? you know, I sometimes sit there and socially and I think of just, let's have a conversation about something. I'll just throw something out rather yeah. than the... Um, the usual stuff, and I just sort of threw out to everyone. There was a few, a few of us. What, what are your three favourite bands? You don't need to tell me now, but just have a think. So when it got to m- me talking about my top three, it was hard to round it out, but right. easily Talking Heads is <laughs> yeah. one of my favourite bands. Mm-hmm. Um, so many great records. They are one of those bands that has incredible singles, but their deep cuts are more my favorite songs but Mm. i love the hits Uh, they've got such an unusual back catalog yes david burns commentary on society through his lyrics is insane he's just a genius isn't he 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 really is a genius the whole story and how they broke up is fascinating and the fact that they've actually come back together and they've done a q a speaking tour for the re-release of stop making sense a24 is releasing it and they have done amazing things with films since they've sort of hit the scene in the last two or three years they have amazing brand recognition in the younger sort of let's say under 30 demographic Mm. so i'm really fascinated to think about how a film that's 40 years old getting a 4k re-release with a remastered soundtrack is going to appeal to a broad audience and i was listening to a podcast the other day where they talk about going to some of the um, screenings in the States. Uh, It's the Big Picture podcast. They are industry insiders, and one of the screenings they went to was hosted by Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth, where she Q&A'd with the band, and there was, in their words, a lot of A-listers in the house. And they said that the audience was generally 40-plus, but in the US, the demographic that has shown the most interest in it from data is 60% under 30. And is that because... A24 is incredible at their marketing to a younger audience or is it that the younger audience is going what is it about this movie everyone keeps talking about this is the greatest concert film of all time and it certainly is an incredible concert film I couldn't unequivocally say that because I haven't seen every (laughs) great concert film Um, but I tell you what I'm really excited because what I hear is that the the film this film that I've seen never on the big screen but have seen on the small screen mm-hmm. has been remastered and apparently Jerry Harrison who's the guitarist keyboardist yes. from the band has actually worked on the remaster oh really brilliant has completely changed the way that the sound is coming at you from the speakers where you yeah. can just hear more nuance and you can hear certain instruments and they've they've reworked the way that the surround sound comes through for example in the song heaven you've got the backing vocals coming from the back speakers and then you've got um 
the band the music coming from the front and from the sides so they've they've changed the way that the dynamic of the sounds coming through and for a lot of people that I've heard talking about it have said that it has completely elevated the experience from an already sort of incredible film really excited to be showing it here at Matakana yeah I think they're really their production on their albums is already miles ahead of of anybody at the time anyway yep. and you know like I said David Burns a genius and I think part of the thing is yes it's probably the marketing but it's also when you think about some of the films that have come out say Guardians of the Galaxy right and you had those soundtracks with those lot of older songs on there and younger people are discovering like for instance my daughter all of a sudden is listening to Johnny Cash mm. or listening to Neil Young and you know she's 19 so I think they're getting exposed to that music and it's becoming very popular again. It really is. And it's on games and it's on all sorts of things. So yeah. that's why the interest is there. I think. I've heard from many friends over the last couple of years that have old, older kids than mine. Mm. When they have a party, they're like, oh, no, what music do I have to put up with? <laughs> yeah. And then they go, man, the, the music was all the stuff I was into. Yeah. It's yeah. a really interesting um, I think streaming has a lot to do with this. Yes. Uh, for better or for worse, you know, streaming music um, has, you know, there's positives and negatives to streaming. But I think one of them is that it's allowing people to discover music from way back mm -hmm. and also probably people who may not listen to newer music. getting, you know, it makes it easier to, to access newer music and to, to not have to worry about spending money on something they might not necessarily like. Yeah. But yeah, the younger kids getting into music that their parents was, were into or still still are into is is a really great offshoot of the streaming era, I think. The other interesting point is that Jonathan Demi is the director of this film. And if you haven't seen it, when you see it, because you are going to see it, <laughs> yeah. you will see why this guy is regarded as one of the great Hollywood directors. He's passed away now, unfortunately. I think it was last year. Um, he also directed the Oscar-winning film uh, Silence of the Lambs, which is a really interesting parallel. But the structure of the film, which I won't go into here, is what makes, not the only thing that makes this film so great, but it really adds to the effect you're getting from it. And as a little bit of a clue, uh, at the time, 1983 is when this was recorded, David Byrne was um, dating a woman from Japan. And so he was spending a lot of time in Tokyo in particular. And he was very interested in performance, Japanese performance theatre, particularly no theatre. Mm. And you can really see the way that his sort of vision for this film then gets crafted by Jonathan Demi using touch points from Japanese theatre. Yeah, well that's going to be great. So next time Dan and I will be wearing big white suits with massive shoulders on it, so we could look like David Byrne. Maybe. Oh, and also, <laughs> one other very special thing about the release here at Matakana Cinemas is the album has been re-released. The vinyl has actually been extremely hard to come by and it's basically the reissue has been sold out in New Zealand and I managed to get pretty much, from what I can understand, the last two copies in the country. One for me. Yeah. And, and one for me. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay, uh, no. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't, okay, three, there wasn't three copies. Sorry, I can share mine with you. <laughs> yeah, or well, you could yeah. come to the screening and That's you right. could be in to win it. Yeah. So we're going to give away through the season... If you come see the movie here at Matakana Cinemas, you drop your ticket in a box and you go in the drawer to win a copy of the reissued vinyl. And it is actually hitting like $300 on reseller wow. uh, markets at the moment because it's pretty much impossible to come by. So that is definitely a good reason to come and see the film here. And on the subject of concerts, Taylor Swift and the Eras Tour. I mean, one of the biggest concerts in the world now it's going to be one of the biggest screenings in the world. So what what sort of things go along with showing a Taylor Swift concert? Yeah, well, I've heard it's actually the highest grossing concert yeah. of all a tour of all time. I think it's over a billion dollars. Yeah, yeah crazy. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you get there? I think there's quite a few reasons. Yeah. You know, you've got to have talent. She's got a very loyal fan base. Um, probably the ticket pricing is pretty high. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then moving into the film and looking at the way that the film is going to be working in theatres and that the concerts have been working is you've got to have extremely good management, right? Mm. Um, we are showing the film here at Matakana Cinemas, but there were really quite tight restrictions on the film. And un unlike, okay. you know, here's a bit of industry talk for you, yeah. Trent. Usually, you know, when you get offered a film we have to show it a certain amount of times per day for a certain amount of weeks, and that is the case with the Eras Tour 
concert screenings here in cinema as well. But there are also some specific time restrictions where none of the sessions could play until after 6 p.m. And we have to play it 15 times across these days. And there's actually set days down. We have to play those 15 sessions after 6 p.m. on these dates. And if we wanted to show additional sessions so that we could cater to the younger Taylor Swift audience, we could, but we still had to play the post 6 p.m. session on all of those days. So even tighter restrictions than your average film release. And I was thinking as I was sort of working through it, I mean, for us, it was a no-brainer to show it. I really mm. want to look after the T-Swift fans in, <laughs> yeah. in the region because I know that the Eras Tour may not actually come to New Zealand. Yeah. And it's a great opportunity to see it on screen. But as I was sort of working through it, I was thinking, it definitely feels like it's not just distribution here, but it's, you know, the, even the cinematic release is being really looked after by her management team, mm. which is fascinating because it's not often the way often... A film gets put out into the wild and the distribution company pretty much looks after everything. So, yeah, really fascinating to work through that. Yeah, I think Taylor, was, she's very much in control of what she wants, yep. which is great. I mean, obviously, she's successful. I love that. Yeah. You know. So she's you know, very careful to make sure that her image and thinking of her fans by the, the screenings at 6 p.m. So I heard that she didn't want you know her fans going out on a school night kind of to start off with so it had yep. to be on a friday and things like that so i think you know that's really good isn't it yeah imagine what it's like in the engine room that yeah. the, the, the back <laughs> yeah. room of let's face it a brand mm. like taylor swift it yeah. must be highly orchestrated and yep. managed to the nth degree yep. it must be a very impressive operation you know and it's off the back of one person who's clearly got talent yes and then it creates its own mini economy it's mm. it's uh, so my mind boggles a little bit at sort of how that would work. And then um, even thinking about the tour itself and the way that the roadies have to set up and sit down, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I saw a video the other day of her on stage and there's sort of, um, it looks like glass shattering on the stage because they've got an LED stage that she sort of performs on and you can see little pieces of masking tape. So she can see exactly where she needs to put her foot for the lighting crew to activate that oh, effect. Wow. Um, yeah, really fascinating. You know, just all the tiny, tiny, tiny details that go into managing a superstar like Taylor Swift. It's, um, yeah, fantastic to be having it here for the local fans. And you'll be in the front row, obviously. For Arms talking here, if it took, first stopped like making sense, look, yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's what you were talking about, wasn't <laughs> oh, sorry. it? sorry. My eyes just glazed uh, over. <laughs> you just look like a Swifty, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with T, but it's talking heads. <laughs> Okay, Dan, so I've got my knife and fork because we're still in our big festival banquet at the moment. So uh, what's happening in the next couple of weeks? The British and Irish Film Festival. It really is the first time we're doing this in this un incarnation. It's from the same people who bring the French and, you know, the French Film Festival uh, to cinemas. And the guys do a really good job of getting the word out and bringing people to the cinema. And we've talked in previous podcasts about how we seem to accelerate the numbers over the last two years of the French Film Festival yeah. from X number to just going through the roof this year. And I'm really hoping that people sort of, um, through the great marketing job that the guys at Limelight do, that we'll be able to get a lot of people through the doors for this. And I do think that British and Irish film is held quite dear in the local area. I think, I think so. When I think back to some of the bigger films over the time I've been here, there are often films with those big British actors and actresses. You know, think Anthony Hopkins, think Maggie Smith, think Judy Dench, think Helen Mirren. If you show a film with those people in it, you're pretty much guaranteed to get a pretty great response. Yeah. Um, the British and Irish Film Festival running until the 5th of November mm -hmm. is something that I'm hugely looking forward to because of those, you know, those stars and yeah. the, the, the pulling power that they have. So I'm expecting a pretty great response and we've already seen some pretty neat um, advanced ticket sales. Oh, that's good. There's, yeah, because there's a Liam Neeson movie. I see every Liam Neeson movie ever made. The biggest made. of all the stars. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also, hello, I'm Michael Caine. And then there's Anthony Hopkins as well. Right? Yeah. So um, just talking about Michael Caine. Michael yep. Caine's into his 90s now, yeah. still going, still doing stuff on film. He's in a film called The Great Escaper. Mm. And it is one of the feature films from the festival. There's four or five titles which are only screening once because the distributors and the festival organizers wanted to make those films a real focus and just play them once and try and get everyone into those screenings because they will get a later release. Right. Um, 
Many of them are getting dated for 2024, but it is an opportunity to see them months before they actually get released in New Zealand cinemas. Um, the Great Escaper, Michael Caine, and Glenda Jackson, who plays his wife in the film, she actually passed away after the film was made, so it's her final film. Michael Caine, his character, he escapes from his rest home and he heads off for the 70th anniversary of the D-Day landings to France and um, it becomes this big sort of story. No one knows what's happened, he just decides to, to go. Um, and his wife is in on it, but they keep it quiet. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, it sounds like a really um, lovely story. Yeah, and it's, um, it's been playing really well and UK theatre's already opened. The chemistry is there, which makes for an, a really, really great pair on screen. And then the story, you know, hinges around that. But it's amazing how the chemistry of two golden age mm. actors can really make a film special, let alone how it looks, yeah. how good the script is, the story and that kind of thing. That magnetism of stars, you know, Michael Caine and Glenn oh, yeah. Jackson, legendary, right? And, and of course, that it's her final film makes that even more interesting. Uh, another one to look out for is Anthony Hopkins in a film called One Life, which tells the story of um, a man who managed to save uh, around about 600 children from the Nazis in the Second World War. Oh, right. So a couple of war-themed yeah. films there. Uh, we've got Helen Mirren as uh, Golda, um, which, you know, pulling out those big names <laughs> again is Helen Mirren. And, of course, we've got The Land of Saints and Sinners with your guy, Liam Neeson. <laughs> so it's set in the 70s, I believe. Yep. He's got a bit of a dark past, which is unusual for a Liam Neeson movie. Yeah, he does, and he has to use an old-fashioned gun. Not, not, you know, he's, <laughs> you're very often seeing him with, with yeah. modern, modern weaponry, but yep. he's got a, a rifle in this film. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so um, a really great lineup of titles. Mm. Those ones are the feature films with the big names, but... Right. The beauty of festivals, as we always talk about, is just digging into some of those those little films that you know you might not necessarily go and see in the theatre. Um, one other film I must mention is Olivia Colman and Jesse Buckley in a film called Wicked Little Letters, which is right. also a feature yeah. film. The basic premise is that uh, in the time that it's set, uh, letter writing is more the format than emails, and um, these really, really intensely written, with a lot of bad language letters start getting distributed around this small village. And Jesse Buckley's character is the main suspect, and it's a, it creates a huge uproar in the village. <laughs> yeah. um, and then it becomes a sort of uh, buddy comedy between Olivia Coleman, who's always fantastic, yes. and Jesse Buckley, who is equally always fantastic. So another one to look out for. So that's the British and Irish Film Festival. So make sure you get on the website and get all the details. And apart from the festivals, any other events coming up at Matakana Cinemas? I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you like scary movies? I do not. Um, so if you're doing a scary <laughs> film festival, you won't see this guy. What's that on your shoulder just there? <laughs> no. <laughs> don't, don't do that. We're in a dark room. <laughs> if you've got kids Halloween movies, I might be there. <laughs> well, I'll see what we can do for you. Some people love sitting in a dark room and getting yeah. the proverbial scared out of them. <laughs> yep. We are doing a little Halloween fest. It's very short and sweet because, yep. you know, Halloween is a very short, short little window. But we've got a selection of four titles. Okay. So from the scariest right. down. Okay. Okay. Let's do the scariest. So we will be showing the new Exorcist oh. film. <laughs> not not my cup of tea either. But um, as the music freaks me out for a start. Classic music though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every small child likes to play that on their keyboard at home <laughs> and then look at you sideways, right? Well, my, my, You're freaking me out, Dan. My daughter does anyway. <laughs> They have this thing about the Exorcist theme song. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, uh, a legendary film. Mm, I think the original absolutely. is 1980. Yeah. Off the top of my head. Exorcist Believer is playing as part of this Halloween fest that we're showing at the end of October. Um, that's the scariest of them all. And some people will really want to see that movie. So mm. we're showing it as oh, a one-off sure. screening. Yeah. yeah. We're also showing a film that I love. And I loved this film as a teenager, The Lost Boys. Oh, really? Kiefer, Kiefer Sutherland. Sutherland. Yeah. Jinx. Yeah. <laughs> a comedy vampire film that's not quite a comedy. Mm. It's a little bit scary. It's yeah. actually a good family film, I think, for slightly older families if you've got teenagers. We're showing The Lost Boys. I'm really looking forward to showing that here because I haven't seen it for a long time, but I loved it as a teenager. Yeah. It's a really fun film. It's set, I think, in Venice Beach off the top of my head. Um, young guy moves, young handsome guy moves into town, and it turns out that... The, the crew he falls in with are actually people.
middle of the night. Of course. Um, yeah, so definitely worth checking out. It happens. Out. <laughs> We've also got some anniversary films from uh, Disney Pictures. We've yes. got Hocus Pocus. Oh, okay. Yep. Right. Which is being re-released. Mm-hmm. And we've got The Nightmare Before Christmas. Right. Which is also oh, that's great. being re-released. Tim so, Burton. So that's perfect for you. Yeah. So you can come along with the kids. Yeah, I think A Nightmare Before Christmas I could deal with. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Because it is before Christmas. You yeah, know? So right. it kind of fits in. So that's our little lineup of films across the uh, Halloween weekend that we'll be showing here at the cinemas. It's okay. Like you've got plenty of candy, so I'll be here for that. So, Dan, there's a lot of big titles still to come out before the end of the year. November looks pretty busy, doesn't mm. it? November releases, yeah. Mm. Let's start with Trolls Band Together. Ah, yes. Yeah, the third film in the f- <laughs> phenomenal franchise yeah. that is Trolls. A little secret. I actually really liked the first film. I haven't seen World Tour, which was right. the second film. I love the way that it was animated, but it used um, sort of felt and it used card and stitching so it was almost like someone was crafting as in yeah the verb <laughs> yeah you know uh stuff on screen you know and tied in with animation and the story was really fun and it it had some real jeopardy for the children because you know the bergens were coming to get the <laughs> you know the children and who are watching it in the audience of course yeah. um and then in world tour the villain was you know the evil like metler you know, there was, there's, there's, I think, quite a lot of irreverence and fun around the mm-hmm. Trolls films. And they're beautifully animated. Um, they're short and sweet. The kids love them. So, you know, we've got high hopes for, for that film. And it'll run through into December as well as we move into the school holidays. Well, the thing with Trolls is too that in sync, they did this big launch. They've come out with a new single for the movie, Justin Timberlake and in sync. And the, the last time they had, they had a song out was 2000. Yeah. 23 years ago was when Bye 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 came out and now NSYNC are back with a new song for this you movie. You must be pumped then. Yeah, yeah you must I'm be pumped. absolutely pumped. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> I mean, of course, you um, can't stop the feeling from the first yes, film. It was a huge hit. Yeah. It was a huge hit. Yeah. Was, I must admit, it's pretty catchy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We heard it way too many times in the cinemas, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. but Trolls, can't wait. Yeah. yeah, really excited. Yeah, and what else is coming out? So at the start of November, we've got EO, which actually played in the New Zealand International Film Festival. I was lucky enough to have caught, I think it was eight films in the festival, mm-hmm. and EO was my favourite film. Yeah. I think it's quite polarising. I think some people will love it, some people will hate it, but you've got to go and see it to know that. Right. Um, it's short and sweet. It's only 88 minutes. It's about the length of Trolls. Yeah. The main thread of it is a donkey who escapes the circus at the start, and he's witnessing humanity. He's witnessing what people are doing. Um, uh, the good and the bad he's witnessing nature he it's literally seen through the eyes of at times and it's also the camera focuses on the eye of the donkey and you see things reflecting out of his eye it's a really incredible film Mm. Um, Polish director who's 84 I can't remember his name off the top of my head right now but he's apparently a legend of Polish cinema Um, the film blew me away when I saw it here during the festival um, I loved it. It'll probably still stand amongst my top films of the year. Right. Um, so personally, it comes highly recommended if you like to see what I call punk filmmaking. It really felt quite um, uh, visceral and beautiful at the same time. It has a lot going on, packed into 88 minutes. I was, right. you know, I came out of the film going, wow, there was so many ideas in that movie, but very much a commentary on humanity and the way humans affect planet Earth. Through the eyes of a donkey. Right. Yeah. Fascinating film. <laughs> uh, and I yeah. will happily see it again. Yeah. Um, we also have coming up Napoleon, which I know. Oh, yes. I know you're Ridley really looking Scott. forward to. Ridley Scott and Joaquin Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. Which is a fascinating combination, mm. um, you know, two superstars of, of the cinema. Um, I don't think we need to say too much about no. Napoleon. I've seen the trailer and it just looks Epic. Yep. It looks like an epic, you know, like the Gladiator kind of epic. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. So for big screen uh, historical action, I think mm. you can't really go much further than that. Yeah. Um, speaking of November films and big screen action, June 2 was meant to be playing. Yes. Um, it's really great to know, even though it's been moved into March 2024, that uh, there's been a resolution with the writer's strike, which is going to help push, you know, production of films back into gear yeah um uh the actors strike is is resolving so you know um 
looking like things are going to be sort of happening again. Great that a lot a lot of films are actually holding their position on the release chart. Uh, we've only had a couple of moves. Yeah. The Dry 2 Which we've already good. talked about and, yeah. and June 2. Maybe yeah. it's sequels that they're moving. Yeah, could be. Um, but Napoleon's <laughs> right there. Trolls is right there. Yeah. Um, we've also got the Marvels coming out. Oh, okay. On November the 9th, uh, the new film in the now, Marvel franchise. That one's a bit shorter, right? You're saying the runtime for it. Well, there's not an official runtime yet, but yeah. it's been estimated at 105 minutes, which okay, is significantly yeah. shorter than mm. your average Marvel film. Yeah. Could almost be the shortest. I mean, I think some of the Deadpool films were shortish. Mm. Um, but at 105 minutes, you're talking about 25, between 25 and 40 minutes yeah. shorter than your average Marvel film. Yeah. I wonder if Marvel and thinking about and looking at you know a bit of self-reflection about what's been going on with superhero films and that one of the hot topics has mm. been superhero fatigue and in, inverted Absolutely. commas yeah. is that um you know maybe there needs to be some sharper editing maybe there needs to be a shorter and sweeter cinematic experience and mm. maybe you can make a short film and still get the same impact yeah um i've actually i'm i'm I must freely admit that I don't see all the Marvel films. I've seen a handful. I'm not a huge Marvel fan. But I did actually see a bunch of footage at a New Zealand film conference a couple of months ago, and it looked good. Mm. It's got a Beastie Boys song on the soundtrack. Well, I mean, there you go. I'm Done. into that. <laughs> Speaking of my favorite bands, yeah, they'd yeah. be in the mix for yeah. sure. So the Marvels is definitely a film to look out for. You may all remember a film called Promising Young Woman, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, starring Carrie Mulligan, very much a commentary, uh, me, very much a Me Too film, very much yeah. a commentary on mm -hmm. uh, women and how they are, you know, treated in society. And that film was quite mind blowing. I don't know if you saw it, but it um, is a really well done film by Emerald Fennell. She has her um, next film coming out called Saltburn. Uh, the lead actor in that is Barry Cohen, who was most recently seen in Banshees of Inisherin. He's a young up and coming Irish actor. And um, that's definitely something to look out for. I think she's definitely going to be trying to be hitting a few of those same uh, touch points as she did in Promising Young Woman. Mm -hmm. Might be might make people squirm in their seats a little bit. Right. But she does make great films. Promising yeah. Young Woman was really, really good. Not always an easy watch, but yeah. an extremely good film. Definitely something to look out for for the art house fans. Mm -hmm. And something too, Hunger Games. There's a Hunger Games movie. My yeah. daughter Aiden, who's a producer of this podcast. The biggest Hunger Games fan ever. I remember when I worked in the UK, I was working for a radio station, and I was sending back photos of they're doing a Hunger Game preview at the theatre in Leicester Square next to where I was working. And yep. I was sending pictures back to Aiden and go, oh, yeah, Jennifer Lawrence, oh, look, they're doing a Hunger Games thing. She was very jealous at yeah. the time. Well, Jennifer Lawrence isn't in these films because these, I, I believe, are prequel films. Um, it feels like a little bit of a throwback to yeah. yesteryear when it comes to movies because the Hunger Games franchise, I do remember the first one that came out, Jennifer Lawrence was not necessarily a huge star at the time. And I remember there was a lot of talk about it being a reasonably low budget first film yeah. and it blew up, it <laughs> yeah. just went off. And then as they produced the sequels thereafter, the budgets got bigger and bigger and bigger and the films got you know grander. Yeah. Um, there are some familiar faces that are coming back to this film um, that releases in mid-November here in New Zealand. And it would be interesting to see if the fans who did really like the originals, who are more grown up now, much I sort of a parallel I think of is the Harry Potter films mm. and then the prequels that came out post. It would be interesting to see what the response is and how a film like that performs in the market, given that it's been quite a while since the originals. And look, the film has to be good too. So, you know, that's what at the end of the day brings people into the cinema. Is the, the film is there singing good. in this one, Dan? Is it like a musical? Well, <laughs> we're getting some nods from over in production. Is it direction. a musical? You know how I feel about musicals, Aiden? Yep. <laughs> okay. It's a musical. Okay. I might go see it. <laughs> <laughs> that that generally rounds up what we've got coming out in November. And uh, as we look forward to December, we've got some pretty big films coming out. So it's great, Dan. You've had a lot of Q&A sessions and you've got another one coming up too. Tell me a bit about that one. Yeah, firstly, Q&A screenings. I love them. When mm. I come along to them, I'm often here. I'm often facilitating the Q&A. Just adds such another 
layer and and vibe to the whole experience of coming to the movies you know if you've got someone who's an actor or a director involved in the film the next one is taking back our beach which we're doing on the 8th of november so director anton Steele oh, is cool. going to come along and okay. he's gonna yeah he's going to introduce the film and then we're going to ask him some questions little kiwi film little documentary uh it's it's based on the events of the rena hitting astrolay brief in the bay of plenty in 2011 splitting and putting oil through the ocean. Uh, the local community is having a huge amount of dif difficulty getting any response for cleanup yeah. through official channels, so they take matters into their own hands. It's a story about community, um, the difficulties you have, the coming together of community in difficult times, things that are universal, right? And I think, you know, in terms of recently, you, know, you yeah. think about the flooding that we've had yes. in, yeah. in the Hawke's Bay and up in Auckland and communities rallying and coming together. Um, Kiwi battlers, you know, doing the right thing. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yet another in the lineup of great Q and A screenings. And I think it's something that I would love to have. You know, people who are involved in our community, you know, potentially the Matakana community group, come along and and have a listen because you know we might pick up some ideas about how to be more resilient. Yes. Uh, in terms of you know what's been happening with the climate. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a you know really fascinating example of a community doing their thing to to clean a place up after a, such a disaster so you're yeah, pretty excited for the back end of 2023 it's looking much more rosy than it did at the back end of 2022 so happy with what's coming up